Uh, you know what? I'll just say this. Is the grocery store gonna get mad at me if I complain about the carts not being returned? Wait, what? <laughs> like, if I come on the podcast and complain about something or talk about something, yeah. am I supposed to talk about no people, places, or things while I'm here? Honey, you've got a big storm coming. Hello, everyone. How are you today? I hope you're having a really good day so far. If you're new here, my name's Taylor. I come to you from Baltimore City, Maryland, and here on my YouTube channel, I feature content that's generally focused on knitting and spinning. In this week's episode, I'm gonna catch you up on what I've been working on, but I also wanna finally review some of the questions that you all have asked me in the forum that I've linked to below. I have mentioned this probably on several occasions at this point, but some of you had great questions, and again, I apologize for ignoring you, but we will get into some of those answers. I wrote them down when I had a spare moment because I do record everything I upload here online with my phone. And so anyway, here's the questions. The first question is, are you getting much wear from your Tecumseh sweater? Can you wear it indoors three seasons of the year? No, I do not. I, I have given that sweater away to the thrift store for a couple of reasons. One, the yarn that I knit the contrast color in bled into the main color. So it didn't look nice and clean any longer. And I was playing a game of yarn chicken with my version of that sweater. And I knit the ribbing of the sleeves with all of the remaining contrast yarn in order to stretch my yardage. And the sleeves were still a bit short. They were always a three quarter length. So for that reason, I didn't get a lot of wear out of it in the winter months, even though it was a warm sweater. I would say in Maryland, I could have probably gotten a considerable amount of wear from that sweater in the fall and winter, not so much in the spring or summer, because it's, it's a heavier sweater. Um, so I don't, I don't even wear that sweater anymore because I don't own it, but it was, it, was, it was a great sweater to make. It was one of the first sweaters I've ever knit that I can recall and the design was really fun. I loved, I think I was learning color work knitting around that time, um, or at least like, you know, expanding my horizons of color work back then. How much of the year can you wear your globe braid bra from Veronica in Calgary? I also don't wear my globe braid bra because I accidentally washed it in the washing machine and I felted it to a size that would no longer fit. Um, so unfortunately I did have to throw that away and I haven't yet knit another. I think I should. And I think if it's knit with the right yarn, I could wear it any season. Sometimes in here in Maryland, like July and August, it's so hot out that nothing is comfortable worn next to skin. Um, I try to layer like very oversized shirts that have a lot of room for airflow. So I wouldn't wear, um, I wouldn't wear a wool bra, but I still do sometimes. There are wool bras that I've worn in the summer, like Superwash. Uh, merino. I don't really purchase or invest in superwash merino though any longer because I find that the color is really inconsistent. Over time it fades dramatically, especially those garments that you wash considerably um, often. But I think the perfect combination for a close to skin knit is like a cotton wool blend. I was just visiting uh, flying Fibers in Pennsylvania, um, up uh, it's near Lancaster, and they have a Brooklyn Tweed base of yarn. I forget the name of it, but it's a cotton blend. It felt so soft in the hand, um, and that sounds like, I don't know what the gauge actually would be, if it would match the gauge of that pattern, but something like that, something that's like a cotton blend that's very soft would be a perfect match for that bra pattern, and I think could be worn almost any season. So um, I originally knit mine with a cotton blend milled out of Green Mountain Spinnery. Um, and that's definitely a DK weight. I can't recall the weight of the Brooklyn Tweed yarn, but wow, that was really, really soft. Um, where is your green double 
handled knitting bag from that was shown in your Rhinebeck 2023 video. Uh, that must be this one. Uh, I think I've shared this bag since you might have asked that question, but I, I don't mind to repeat myself. This is a bag made, I think, in North Carolina. The brand is called Magner, M-A-G-N-E-R. They do sell these at your local yarn store and online. I bought this on vacation in um, Bath, Maine. There's a yarn store there called Halcyon Yarns. You can buy all of their colors on their website. Um, and I love that it has handles on both sides. You can kind of hold it like this and knit on the go. It's nice and big. I can fit multiple projects in here or a full size sweater, um, four skeins very comfortably. And it has these lovely, gorgeous leather pull tie things. The pockets on the inside, I don't really use the big main pocket much, but it does hold a pattern printed on your typical A4 paper folded in half perfectly. So if you print out your patterns, you can easily tuck it in there. And then here there's a couple areas for you to slide your needles, a little wider pocket and another pocket with a zipper, which is great for small notions. And this is, this is my everything knitting bag. I have a little bit of everything thrown in here. Um, and right now all of my projects are kind of scattered. So this is sort of like a junk drawer of knitting, but I love, love, love this bag and it was totally worth the money. And there's so many great bags on the market these days, but this is one of the best, um, like fabric bags in my opinion. Um, a long time ago, I did invest in the fringe bag. So if you're wondering like the comparison of those, like this one's a little bit bigger and it has a nice wide base. You can hold more yarn in this. Um, these I, I keep because I, I bought them. Why wouldn't I make use of what I have? I hate the thought of wasting anything. So um, these are kind of like the background bags. And the one I carry around most is this one. On the subject of knitting bags, I am in love. And every Friday I forget to check her listings because she posts maybe once a week or every other week. But um, Knitting Nellie's quilted project bags are like my favorite aesthetically. They're just gorgeous. In fact, I wish I had my phone available right now to look and see if they are online still. But she makes the most lovely quilted knitting bags and I think hers are gorgeous. Okay. I'm surprised to not see any Naturium products in your skincare list. Any particular reason? I um, I am a huge fan of no BS No BS Beauty on YouTube. She's just a, she's just a personality here in the skincare YouTube scene, and she despises Naturium because of some uh, inappropriate. With, how do you say it? I don't know. Susan Ya, the former owner of Nutrium, she just sold it for, I think, $500 million. She is a YouTube personality who, you probably know this, but she's a YouTube personality who was marketing this brand Nutrium that at the time no one knew she was invested in. So that is, I think, not legal. And then when she finally came out and said, this is my brand, a lot of her audience was like, what the hell? You've been talking about this brand for months. You never disclosed you were the owner and that's not honest. So No BS Beauty has always kind of led that, um, with that message that's like, hey, Nutrium is really affordable, but Susan Yara, who, is the founder, was very dishonest in the starting of this company, blah, blah, blah. And it just, it was always kind of on my radar through YouTube, but I don't personally shop at Target in person or even online all that much. Um, and that's sort of like where those products are sold the most. So I've never really interacted with the brand at all, except to hear criticisms of the founder. And so I never tried a lot of her things. I've looked at the ingredients lists. Um, I find them a little overwhelming. Sometimes there's one thing or another that I don't love. 
and I did try her vitamin K serum because someone recommended it and I didn't like it. I actually returned it. I really love K-Beauty. I find it more affordable and gentle and just really up my street. So that's the only reason I haven't dabbled in Naturium. I was looking at your Dathan pullover and had a curiosity. Since you naturally dyed the same fleece in four different colors, did you notice any resulting textural differences between the colors of locks or yarn? Micah. I'm gonna say yes and no. Overall, the fleece that I dyed with natural materials all came out a little bit, um, a little bit broken and a little bit dull. It all spun easily and I heavily overspun and overplied that very light fingering yarn. So it provided a fabric that was knit into a very hard wearing but still light material that will hold up forever. And that sweater has never pilled. Um, there is one color I used in the making of that sweater that was from a different fleece entirely. And I did notice a slight textural shift. That's because the fiber was different and it wasn't processed the same way. I think it's a natural color, so I didn't dye it. And um, maybe it just held a little bit more air between the fibers. It was a little less beat up in terms of like processing. I think that when I naturally dyed that fiber, I probably used a very high heat for perhaps too long of a time. So it did feel like the fab, the fiber as it was combed was damaged a little bit more in the process of processing. So not a huge amount of difference between them. They, they were shockingly consistent for the amount of time I had been spinning. So I hope that answers your question, Micah. Have you spun much wool that is washed and already carded? Um, have you spun much wool that is washed and already carded? So yes, I have, but not have you spun much wool? Yes, I've spun a shawl. The feral shawl design was an early hand spun project of mine. And then I've spun more of that fiber more recently. And it's just a little bit more of a coarse fiber. So I can't remember what I did with that, actually. Anyway, that was given to me, that carded fleece. I don't pick up many bats of wool. I have a drum carter because I thought I would be spinning so many bats. But then I just found that I really love my hand combs and I just love combing yarn or wool. I love to comb wool and spin hand combed wool. I would like to know more about your choice of clips in the intro. What are they from? It is hilarious and I would like to know more about it in context. Esther. Um, so <laughs> I don't, I'll tell you what inspired it. I got a comment on a video once that was just something to the effect of like, shut up about this or that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, am I, should I not talk about anything here? That was kind of like my internal response to a, a negative comment I got online. And I just happened to have been watching the Bald and the Beautiful podcast with Trixie and Katya, which is one of my favorite YouTube shows, podcasts here on YouTube. It is not safe for work. It is not safe for children. Sometimes they discuss the most debaucherous of subjects. And so I'm just warning you, if you're going to go check it out, um, be warned. It's not safe for work. Um, but they're hilarious. And of course, you've seen the intro probably a gazillion times and you know what I'm referring to. The clips that follow that, I think they're just one in the intro, is just a random like internet funny haha moment. I think it's a woman, an actress um, reading lines to, or like ad-libbing for like a audition. I don't need friends, they disappoint me. You could stop at five or six stores, or just one. Can I ask you kind of a weird question? 
I am the queen of the universe. The waves part and they engulf me and the water is warm. I can't stand it when she touches me. It's something I just stumbled across that I thought fit the montage well. So random funny moments online, I just collect them on occasion. Sometimes I remember to pepper them in my actual editing, but I think I was on a kick when I made that intro, which I feel like I've redone a few times and I probably am due to redo again, but I haven't made time for much video editing lately. Do you have any tips for keeping your hair contained during sleeping hours? Claudia. Oh, hey, Claudia. Um, that's the last question for today. And I will say, yes, actually one of the best things I could probably do is sleep with it up like I have it now, which is a coincidence that I did that. Um, because when my hair is on top of my head, it's not like getting all tangled and messed up. Um, so that would be one thing. Uh, another thing I do is I will gather it behind me and I will wrap it up into a sock and then whip that sock around in a bun and sleep with it inside of a sock. Um, and that really does help a lot. I think I've mentioned that before. Maybe I tried to answer this question and never, I don't know. I feel like I've said that once or twice, but Anyway, let's dive into what I've been working on. I'm going to review the projects on my needles. A lot of them I haven't touched in a minute. Um, but one thing I've cast on since you've seen me last. I might have knit a few rows on my second sleeve of the Chained Oblivion. This is a gorgeous cardigan design with this absolutely lovely cable. I don't know why I've been sleeping on this, except for I know I won't be wearing it for a long while. Um, another pattern I've still been working on, but not picked up, is the Ridgies cardigan by Gudrun Johnston. It has this nice garter rib at the bottom, which I really like. I've never done a garter rib before. And it's just lovely. And it's knit from side to side. So I have one front panel finished. I think this is the dramatic slope of it. There's gonna be a, I think that there's a collar. So imagine this to be kind of like a wide set front piece. I think later on, once it's time for the sleeves, this will be seamed up the side and then I think some of these stitches get picked up and worked into the sleeve. So it's kind of like a continuous front panel situation, but I'm, I'm like a significant part done with this. If you think about it, this is the front half. And then, so this is like a quarter of the body and then the sleeves. So I'm about maybe one seventh of the way through this project. I did pick up and start the second panel. But I was like, you know what, this is just so easy. I'm going to do something else now and I will get back to this later. And so this has just been in a constant state of hibernation in recent months because I keep telling myself I can work on it whenever and then I don't because it just doesn't make sense to do one thing at a time. Well, every surface around me has either dust or hair and there's no great place to put anything down. <laughs> I have been spending a lot of my recent time cleaning my house because I have three cats and a dog and that's a lot to keep up with. Um, so there's some areas of my life where I've been very focused and others not so much. Um, but yeah, I don't know what, I don't know. I don't know what I'm even talking about anymore, but. All of my projects are in different bags and I would like to figure out a better solution here. So I think because of the sheer size, this might become my Ridgie's bag and maybe I'll pick that up again sooner than later. Um, more than often, more than often, more often than not, I do pick up the sleeve to carry around in the car and whatnot because it's so small. Um, 
and I'm so close to being done with this sleeve. Like it's literally seed stitch and then time to pick up and knit the body to join the sleeves and then work the yoke. I've cast on a knit several weeks ago, the artist shawl. I'm almost done with the first section, which is the textured stitch pattern. I think it's called waffle stitch. Haven't worked on this for no good reason, except I decided I was going to participate in Andrea Mowry's March to May Knit Along. I always think that I might, and then I don't, and then another year goes by. And I picked out this yarn and I knit this swatch a long time ago. You might remember it, and I did feature it in one of my last videos, um, but I knit this swatch and I like it. I like it a lot. And just based on how often I'm able to wear this silk mohair against my skin, I feel like I will be able to wear this project also in the warmer months. Um, it's a short sleeve design. I don't think I mentioned already, it is the Velocore pattern by Andrea Mowry that I decided to finally cast on. Um, I set this aside because I thought maybe the fiber content would be too warm to wear in summer. And also, I think I believed at the time I didn't have quite the yardage I needed. Before casting on recently, I determined I had plenty of yardage based on the pattern to execute the entire design. Um, but one thing I'm worried about is you cast on and then you work several inches until you split for the front and the back. And I'm a little bit worried that the circumference of the upper arm is going to be tighter than I want it to fit. So I'm going to consider relative to um, how I feel in the moment, um, I'm going to consider splitting for the front and the back a little sooner than the pattern recommends so that I can guarantee I have a nice amount of space for that upper arm to fit nice and comfortably. It's sort of like a sleeveless drop shoulder type of vibe. It probably has some sort of finishing edge, like a ribbing edge to finish off the sleeves, but it's, it, at distance, it looks like it's just a very simple square type of top. I don't recall there being any neck shaping in the pattern. At least I know I read through the pattern when I downloaded it and I looked at it and that underwhelmed me a little bit. I, I always prefer to have some sort of neck shaping in projects that I knit because they just fit so much better that way. Long story short, I'm gonna add some short rows to the back. The Velocor. <laughs> it's like almost April. Well, we have one week till April. I've not been doing well with deadlines right now. I have completely abandoned the drafting of this pattern I'm wearing you might have wondered about that. I've put so much pressure on myself to do everything all at once that I I just put it aside and I haven't. I've fully graded this pattern in 12 sizes. I have all of the math. I have all of the instructions mapped out. I just haven't recorded the actual stitch counts into the written draft because the stitches, the stitch counts are in my spreadsheet and the written pattern is in a PDF, like Word document. So I have to just combine all that information into a final draft and then review that and make sure it's accurate and then eventually get it into testing because you do have to make sure everyone can understand what you're writing. Um, I have designed several, two, three, two similar, um, similar pattern instructions because they were top down. Raglan, cardigans already. So this is just another new iteration of a top down raglan cardigan from me. I get a lot of joy out of creating cardigan patterns because I have strong feelings about how garments should fit me personally as an individual person that makes garments. I like mine to fit me a certain way. One other thing too that um, I learned since I published my first 
knitting pattern. I started working for a company that manufactured leather jackets and vests for like the motorcycle industry. And in the motorcycle community, there is a huge variation of sizes. You have women's sizes, like women's extra small, all the way up through men's 12X. I handled a lot of the returns. So even though I wasn't in the warehouse, I would frequently like touch and feel and observe um, garments that were very diverse in size. Something I noticed about the largest sizes is that it was never the back neck width and then the upper arm circumference that was dramatically different from, from other sizes in the largest of sizes, but it would be the slope of the shoulder to widest bust. This would change very little, but the distance of that slope was the hugest portion of the variation. Does this make sense? I don't, I'm not good with words. Anyway, that's how I grade my patterns mostly is like this is not all that bigger across the sizes. It's somewhat bigger, but not all that much bigger. And then the major difference from a top down yoke gets to here where you're increasing at a larger rate to get to a wider bust, if that means anything. I really need a new show to watch. I think that if I had a, a new show to watch and something to sit down in front of, I would probably knit a lot more than I have been. Um, there's just nothing that really grabs my attention on any of the various platforms. So if you have any recommendations on what to watch on television, I would love to know. I think I have a Paramount Plus subscription right now. Um, it's like really cheap, like $3. And then I have Hulu, which I paid $1. five for. I signed up, signed up for Hulu during Black Friday because you'll get a 12 month deal for like 12 bucks. Obviously it's too late to do that now, but maybe next year if you're looking for a deal. Um, and I think that's it. And I think we have Peacock too. So Peacock, Hulu, and Paramount Plus, those are my options. I also have Disney Plus right now um, for like a month, but I, I try not to hang on to prescription or subscriptions that I'm not watching. Um, but if you have any recommendations for me on what to watch on television, I would love to know. I have just been like fully detached from watching a program. And I think that's why I'm struggling to sit down and knit. Do you knit multiple projects at once? Does it make you feel overwhelmed like I do? I feel a little overwhelmed by the number of projects in front of me. I think that I've found in the past that I prefer to work on maybe two at a time, but at this point I have like four projects going and it's just too much to feel a sense of accomplishment. Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you. And some of you are not gonna like to hear this. I know, I know that you're gonna judge. I know that some of you are gonna judge me for this, but I have fallen into a Dave Ramsey wormhole. I don't know how it happened. I, when I first discovered his YouTube channel, I first read his Wikipedia page. I'm fully aware of his controversy as a uh, employer and person. And, you know, I'm sure it's fair criticism, but I just like to learn from people that I have nothing in common with, how they think of things that they are more educated on than I am. Like, I don't know, I don't know anything about finance really. I do bookkeeping and I've learned a lot about how other people run their businesses. And I can see clearly how people do well and how people don't and best practices of like bookkeeping. <laughs> but um, personal finance is not something I've known much about. And I realized uh, about a month ago that I need to start a budget and I need to be um, in better track of my spending and I need to start saving for retirement. And with that and opening a Roth IRA, I need to know a little bit about index funds and what to invest that money into. So I've been working a lot on that. And um, I don't know why, but I just find myself incredibly entertained by the various 
Ramsey personalities, they call them. There's like a semi-diverse group of people um, that host this show. And I just really like to listen to other people's stories and where they're at in life. And there's like success stories and there's stories of people struggling. And it's just kind of pulls you out of your personal experience in life. And you kind of put yourself in the shoes of other people and think, um, you know, how do we all be our best? I don't know. I just, I really enjoy this program. <laughs> There's this other side podcast on the network called Smart Money Happy Hour, which is this guy, George, who's like an uber square. Um, his family's from, his parents immigrated from Syria and Egypt but he's like the whitest guy you've ever met. It's like kind of funny how like nerdy this Costco king is. And the co-host is Dave Ramsey's daughter who was raised by this financial, like, I don't know, guru or whatever. He's been publishing books and leading programs and stuff for like many, many years. And so the, the, Financial principles of this entire platform are just how to live without debt. Um, there are these like so many things. I've listened to so much of this program already. I could tell you like everything about it, but it's like there's six or more baby steps where like make sure you have a thousand dollar emergency fund and then pay off all your debt from the smallest amount to the largest, regardless of interest. And then make sure you have three to six months of savings in the bank for emergencies. And then make sure you're investing up to like 15% of your income into retirement. And don't live beyond your means. Pay for everything you can um, in cash. Don't carry debt. And um, I just, I don't know. I feel like there, I thought I was doing really well, like managing my money coming in and my money going out. But last fall, I would say, I noticed shopping was my um, form of escaping the regular world. Like I would just build shopping carts and sometimes I would abandon them and sometimes I would check out. And more often than not, I was checking out all my shopping carts and I was buying anything I wanted whenever I wanted it because I could afford it. But I also wasn't saving for retirement. And at, I'm almost 39, so it's like time to prepare for my future because I've been in the workforce for like 20 years, more than that, but not making much money. Um, so, you know, I'm like halfway to retirement and I don't have anything saved. So um, I'm, I'm on the right track now that I've kind of had this wake up moment where I'm like, whoa, I need to do, I need to spend less money. <laughs> and, you know, I knew that years ago when I was buying yarn and not knitting with all of it. And I decided I'm going to be better and buy less yarn. And I'm going to do a no buy or a low buy. And then I found that instead of, I was really good at not buying yarn, but I was still spending money and I just wasn't spending it on yarn. So I kind of, just started spending my money on like cosmetics and skincare and learning everything I could about cosmetics and skincare. Like I had previously done with fiber and yarn. I learned everything I could about fiber and yarn or not yet. I mean, everyone could always know more, but I was deeply invested in yarn and fiber. And then thinking I was doing something better for my financial future and not purchasing more of the same I just shifted the category of spending to cosmetics and skincare. And then I finally woke up and in January I said, I'm going to do a budget. That's my 2024 goal is save more money. Um, my target was to spend 60% less than I had been spending on average. So I, I established a very, strict budget for my monthly like want expenses um, and not, not just want some needs like gas phone 
those utilities that I just personally cover that aren't part of our joint um, monies. But um, I've successfully cut my spending 30% over last year's average. So I'm doing well, but I wasn't hitting my target of 60%, which is insane. So I was like, okay. And one thing that Dave Ramsey has stated on an episode is that it can take about three months to dial in a, a new budget. And so in January, I pretty much flopped my goal. In February, I did about the same. And I thought, okay, well, whatever I'm trying to do isn't working perfectly yet. I've made progress, but I haven't gotten to where I want to because I feel like I have catching up to do in terms of saving for retirement. So I'm trying to be more aggressive than I've ever been towards saving. Because I don't want to be in a position in life where I have to rely on Social Security to pay all of my bills. Like I want to live a life as comfortable as I do now when I'm not, no longer able or willing to participate in the workforce. Like I want to retire. I think everyone does. But I don't think everyone is willing to stop and consider what has to be done right now or what needs to have been done in the past. Like, what do we need to do to make up for the past? Because I don't want to live with the stress of not ever having enough. I want to feel secure and comfortable. And so right now I'm forcing myself to live in a false, in a false insecurity. Like I am pushing myself into an uncomfortable edge of what I can't afford and deciding that what I thought I could once afford, I'm deciding now I cannot afford to spend on this and that so that I can later on afford to live the way that I do now. Does this make sense? Do I make sense to you? Am I, am, are you, are you there? Hello? Anyway, I, I've just been fixated on saving. So another principle of the Dave Ramsey show which is embarrassing. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, whatever. One of the things that you must do if you want to save money is write down a budget. And I, I did that. I looked at every single dollar coming in and going out and I'm tracking my spending in a way I never have. And I think in March, I finally figured it out and I finally found a way I haven't gotten to my goal yet, my aggressive, insane goal of spending 60% less than I did last year on average. I've gotten it to 50% this month with my new uh, method of writing everything down. As soon as I make a purchase, I put it in my spreadsheet and I track my spending every day. I track what I spent and how much I have left in my budget to spend. And so I'm just tracking it daily and it makes me feel so much more secure to just know day by day how much do I have available to work with and what do I need? Like, what do I want versus what do I need? The other day I was on the Target app and I thought, I really want to try the super affordable brow and lash serum, but I have to spend this much money to get free shipping and I'd really like to clean and detail my car. And in order to do that, I need $12 and you know, like stuff that it just adds up, but you don't need it. Like I can wait till next month to buy these luxury items that are like just basic repair and maintenance. You know what I mean? Like they're not even like luxurious. They're just general repair and maintenance that I'm budgeting into my life. I'm not buying everything the moment I feel like I want it. I'm deciding, do I need this right now? I don't. So when can I afford it? And then I'm working towards earning the chance to spend that money. It feels good to know I have a method that's going to work. So I have, like I said, I've made progress from January, February to March, and I'm really excited for the month of April to start a fresh month where I'm not still figuring it out, but I have a solid approach 
and I've developed new techniques to saving money. I'm not shopping at the two most organic grocery stores. I go to Aldi and I get my citrus and my bananas and a few other items that cost half the price. And then I'll go to the fancy or organic grocery and there I'll pick up my niche items like flax milk and kombucha or whatever that are also at like better prices than I can get even at Aldi. So I'm just shopping with more intention of saving versus convenience. And that has been rewarding. I'm even <laughs> tracking, like when I go to the grocery store, I have a grocery list because I'm mapping out my budget. I kind of know what I need and I, I'm not kind of just shopping on a whim. And then I'm, I'm tracking how much each item costs as I add it to my cart so that I can know at a glance the next time I'm at Wegmans, how much I would have spent at Aldi for various things that are just staples in our household. I don't know, whatever. I just like to overanalyze everything. Maybe you noticed. Well, I think that I might have exhausted this topic of conversation already, but tell me, do you have a budget? Do you map out your spending every month? Have I inspired you to maybe approach your finances differently? I'm curious to know, have you knit a velocore yourself? How did you manage your yarn? Because maybe you didn't knit with mohair silk held double, but this is a disaster. I am like wasting a ton of time just not managing my yarn well. Hello everyone, how are you today? I just scared. Orange tabby. Our peach tree is in bloom. So exciting. All of the blueberry bushes are growing new leaves. The daffodils are daffodiling. My hellebores are sliving. And I can't wait to gather their seeds this year and try to propagate more from seed because I have grand plans. Um, all of these hyacinths, except the white ones, the white ones I bought last, the fall before last. Um, but all the others are from my neighbor. And I actually kind of like this little daffodil zone, but in the summer and fall, it would be bare without something else there. So I really don't know what I'm doing in this garden space, but one of the most exciting things is our pawpaw trees. We have three pawpaw trees. We started them from seeds. There's all these little buds. I have tried a gazillion times to get my camera to focus on them. Um, it won't, but they're these little burgundy velvet buds, which makes me think we might have flowers. And with flowers, we might have fruit. So it is springing all around and my Bleeding hearts are finally coming up again. And then these hugras, these were buried under leaves and they are coming back to life. So I'm really excited to see what the spring and summer will unfold. I also planted this extremely invasive <laughs> um, little ground cover. It's very like light colored, which I think will be nice in heavily shaded areas. But I'm going to retool everything. These were, um, these were one plant that had just popped up, I think from a bird, had dropped a seed. Um, what are they called? I forget right now. I can't remember. Um, but maybe I'll do some, maybe I'll split them up more and, you know, position them in other areas. I'm not sure. There's not really a, a huge amount of rhyme or reason. It's just one thing after the next. But... My big grandiose plans are to replace this forsythia. I love forsythia bushes, but I'm realizing that they thrive much better in full sun. And this is like pretty much deep shade right underneath a power line here. So I can't put a tree. I could maybe do another peach tree and keep it well trimmed, but um, I'm not sure. Not sure what to do. My rose bush. Okay, first the lilac. The lilac 
is doing great, but my rose bush is exploding with growth. So that is exciting. Um, but I really do want to retool that very back bed and get one or two, maybe even a third if I can fit it, shrub that tolerates shade, might be an evergreen. I would like it to be six to seven feet tall, but narrow. And I don't know what might grow fast enough that can live there. If you have any suggestions, I'd love to know what your suggestions are. I do have um, a couple camellia shrubs in the front yard where we have full west facing uh, bed. And I don't know, would a camellia thrive back there? They're so pretty. I would really like to have a few of those. I know that they're not quite as tall, but maybe I could do a few different things. So I'd love to know your thoughts. That is a fig tree to the right, if you didn't know. So it does put out some shade when it leaves out, but maybe I'll do more figs. I'm not, I'm not sure. I would love to know what your thoughts are. I could certainly propagate more fig trees or even get different varieties from the store. But we already have four fruit, five fruit trees with that one fig. If we could fit more, I'd love to fit more, but I'd really like it to be aesthetically pleasing in the backyard, in that back corner, because Forsythia did not put on blooms in a way that it had before. So I think I wanna fix that. Um, that's our little garden tour for the week and I'll see you all soon. One week later. Welcome to this week's garden tour. It is a overcast and rainy day here in Baltimore. Our peach tree is in bloom. It is starting to leaf out. I am so excited for peaches this summer. My chard has never been more charged. That was a stupid pun. Um, I forget what this is. It's some kind of like Asian spinach, but I should probably try some of these leaves in like a super setting. I am seeing that my attempt at propagating my echinacea has minorly succeeded. I have like one over here. I think that's one there. Um, that might be another one there, but there's not as many as I attempted to start, so they might have not all taken but the blueberries are starting to put on new growth and tons of buds, um, not so many on this plant or this plant I don't think has any. I think I moved this plant, so I might've stressed it out. I think I moved both, I don't remember. I don't remember anymore. But um, the hellebores were so much prettier before I pressure washed. <laughs> I, I definitely like beat them up a little bit, but they're still pretty. And my bleeding hearts are really starting to come up. This blueberry is so happy. There are so many buds on this. Hopefully there's enough on the other plant to fertilize those flowers. Uh, but I have, um, I forget what this is called. It looks like that one is like so much further along than this one. Columbine is what that is. These are my favorite daffodils, but they're not putting on as many flowers as the other daffodils. I'm really curious to find out how this yarrow is gonna do once the daffodils are gone. But we have, oh, this um, blackberry, That two of those canes didn't really make it. I thought they would, but I'm gonna cut back those canes and then I'm gonna dig up that one cane still 
doing well and I'm gonna transplant it over here. And I'm gonna train my blackberries over this uh, trellis. Our pawpaw trees have little buds on them. Just a few on this tree. This tree has like, I wanna say none, maybe one or two buds on this tree. And then this tree has a ton. This tree has buds galore. So the backyard is really in bloom. I have a lot of raspberries popping up behind the bird bath. And I think I need to try to move them back to the raspberry patch. That's a quick little garden tour. I did pressure wash this area. So it was really clean and now it's dirty again, but I'll just quickly spray it down again next week or so. And did you see this cute little lamb? I need to find a nice plant to put in there. And our stinging nettles are really blowing up. Anyway, that's that. Ship is looking for cat food to chew on. So time to go back inside. It is so cold out today. That is it for this week's episode of the Thread to Men podcast. I want to thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far into this week's video, let me know in a comment below with your favorite money emoji. I really like the stack of bills flying away. That's one of my faves. Um, so if you haven't already, please like this video and give it a thumbs up. It really helps me growing my channel here on YouTube. And if you haven't already and you've made it this far, why not subscribe? I know like 45% of you or more are not subscribed to my channel. Maybe you'd like to do that now. Maybe, I don't know. But I wanna thank you again so much for being here and also, you know, let me know in a comment below what you're working on. I love to hear your thoughts about making garments or, you know, materials, plans, anything relevant that you feel like sharing. I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. I read all of your comments, obviously. I think you can tell by now, but um, let us know what you're working on, what you're up to whether you have a budget, whether you manage every dollar coming in and out. And if I'm not the only person here in this knitting world who can somehow appreciate uh, Dave Ramsey's contribution to shaming us for spending money we don't need to, I'd like to know that too. And I think that's, I think that's definitely it for this week's episode of the Throw to Men podcast. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day, a wonderful week. If you wanna find me on social media, my name is Taylor E. Owen on Ravelry and Instagram. You can find me over on TikTok as Taylor Knits. I don't really TikTok these days, but um, I hope you all have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and that you take care.